not suggest the how you look to read Wikipedia, which is never wrong. Uh, there's a page on, uh, I don't think it's exactly an accent, but the, the regionalism is like the New Hampshire speech, which is super interesting. And there's all those things like in England, like they say, university. They don't say the university. I'm, I'm going past the obvious jokes and the two stories. But, but you've got, like you say, like, you know, in hospital, in university, and so those kinds of things where they leave off the definite article. And uh, they do that a lot. I think they do that a lot. There's all kinds of weird regionalisms, but it's funny to read that article and do the four Yorkshiremen sketch in your head while you're reading it. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen the original of that? I think the only one I've ever seen is the one where they're all on stage live. Is there, is there a, like, a flying circus version of that, or it was televised? Well, the version that we probably both see, I believe, is Monty Python Live at the Yeah. And awesome. so it's, like, Helen, Cleese, Chapman, and uh, the other Terry, Terry Jones. It was originally done on a show that Cleese and I think Chapman, Cleese and somebody else wrote for it. It was Cleese, Marty Feldman, uh, it's four guys, but it's, it's it's still really funny. I You know, obviously they, I guess, kind of, I, to me that's the canonical version of the Mighty Python thing. But, um, God, what a terrific sketch. And it's so compact, the whole sketch is like two minutes long. It's, it's perfect. It's still, it's still perfect. You can still watch that sketch today and immediately grok what's happening. I still think the accents make it funnier for us. Oh, yeah, you've said that before. Yeah, you mentioned that about how watching... Are talking about Monty Python? Anime or Monty Python, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an extra bit. Because it's a humor in it, it they sound kind of funny to us. And it, it, I thought that definitely answered it. I, you know, obviously we're missing something, too. There's a cultural part that we're missing, but I think it's more than made up for the fact that they all sound funny to us. Uh, I absolutely, and like when I find myself... I don't do this nearly as much because I'm not in high school anymore, but when I would... When I had a better memory and uh, less self-consciousness, I could just participate in a Monty Python sketch-off and just just quote them and do all the you know there she go, there she go, Gavna, you know that kind of thing. And like I don't know what accent that is, but I, I know that that's an accent, and it does make it funnier, absolutely. I thought you were on my back. 
Is that how maybe I'm on your back? I don't know. So what? Yeah, back. exactly. This is for this best. Um, he, uh, David Goletley, uh, did this and like amazingly did it with named Photoshop players and, and gave you a lot of really, really fun stuff. Like, I think those are professional crocs you can be wearing. Oh, well, yeah, he makes the match. He took, you know, one from column A and one from column B. So you can, you can make that and like, you, you can do a doctor, I don't know, Dr. Moreau to this thing. <laughs> and people have people have been assembling their own favorite combinations. They even they did you see the one that made me look like Roderick slash you? The Angry Professor? Yeah. That was amazing. So we'll have some of those in show notes for this episode, which you can find at relay.fm slash R E. Not rectifs, Marco. You see that? You see that kind of we, yeah, well we should have uh Rexit. Okay. The kid will fix it. But he's never gonna have we'll figure it out. He's very young and he has a cocky accent, so Anyway, I just wanted to say, um, I, 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 I provisionally apologize for, for keeping scorn on you, even though that's not my thing. Um, but uh, I just did want to say thank you to uh, to David. You should go check out all his stuff. He's, I don't know, I'm always amazed when I can ever look at somebody who draws something and it looks like a thing. I'm always amazed when somebody draws a thing but with style. But he's got so much style and such like his own look for drawing. It's very kind of, what, how would you describe it? Kind of elongated, slightly maybe like, not Art Deco, what's the word? Well, there's hyper-realism in the early ones. If you go to the really early one, he did a picture, a hypercritical picture of mine that I actually have a big print of in my office. Have you ever seen that one? Like in that one, my arms are the length of, like, they're like four times the length. Right? So it's actually become less stylized over time. Well, he's not stuck with the red nose thing, which is the, I mean, you can see that you've got one too. That, that's that's a his bit. Thing. I think his bit. It's not just his bit. Like, look at the, uh, look at Panic's, uh, you know, when Panic has little avatars for themselves. They yeah. have pixelated ones and they have cartoon ones. They have the red nose thing going too. I don't know the origin of it, but I'm pretty sure it is not one person who came up with style, kind of like the various anime styles and throwing characters. Did you ever, did you watch it over the garden wall? No, I've heard about it and I've seen bits and pieces when I'm actually uh, TV uh, I, I, I believe you said in the past that you enjoy Adventure Time. If you like Adventure Time, I'd suggest checking it out. Uh, preview it before your kids see it, because it does have like a, the occasional kind of scary fantasy monster, but it's really fun. And uh, I believe that they have red noses. Horton Hort and Gregory have uh, red noses. Does it have the Cartoon Network logo on the card? Oh, uh, no. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'll see if I can get you on Dutch subs and cover it up. Yeah. Uh, uh, we just shifted through that television. It's not like those shows are banned. They just can't be watched on our television. Do you ever check your calendar? How much time you got left for your quickest? Oh, no. I'm never going back. Oh, I thought you had a calendar. is just to see, like, the idea was everyone was saying, well, it's bad, and mine took an X amount of time to fade, and a couple of the things, you know, a year or more. So I just want to check in in a year and see how it's going. And it's never, Destiny's never coming back. It's heartbreaking. Now, now, once again, there's so many, you know, damn your eyes, John Syracuse, there's so many things where you rubbed off on me. Phrasing. That uh, now I can't unhear fans, and now I can't unsee the cartoon, and now I actually see the Cartoon Network logo, and I think it's an atrocity. Is it, is but, it on, like, even during commercials? But you don't have a plasma TV, so I mean, No, but I'm not I'm mad on your behalf. Yeah, that's well, that's gets careless. The thing is, people without asthma TV, plasma TVs get a little bit, uh, cocky here because they think this can't happen to them but if you've ever looked at one of the screens in an airport and like if it happens that one of them is off for some reason you can see the scene and take it on like uh, or just look at the, the baggage check-in lcds you know those little kiosks where you go to like you know check your bags and oh, stuff and they totally, they're totally ghost, ghostly looking yeah right and those are lcds so if you think lcds can't quote unquote burn in it's not the same mechanism as plasma it's entirely different but the bottom line is when the thing is off or not showing something, you can see something on the screen. And what you can see is whatever's been on the screen for a really long time. Now, those are extreme conditions where the screens are on all day, and they're in the bright sunlight, and they're pretty old, and so on and so forth. So most of your TVs are probably fine, but nobody is. And what really bothers me is, like, if Destiny can't come back to TV until I get rid of this plasma, I'm probably going to replace this plasma with our OLED in a couple of years when they start to settle down. OLEDs also have a little bit so, yeah. so television technology sucks. It does. I, I've been... Watching the wire cutter in the various places. And, yeah, I'm the John Sarkisi, but I don't want to be a total dumbass. The conventional wisdom uh, there and elsewhere seems to be, at least as of a few months ago, it was this is a terrible time to buy because we don't know how 4K is going to shake out. But, you know, they had a couple of good recommendations, you know, in the low four figures, like basically under $2,000 to get a 60 inch TV. I'm very tempted. A lot of people are asking me about televisions, and for the past few years, it's been a bad time to buy because. Plasma's kind of peaked with the one that I bought uh, around that, that era, and then they 
disappear. That was the end. It was the end of an era. Uh, especially, it was a great time to buy when plasmas had the best pictures and the best response time and the lowest input lag and were actually also cheaper than the highest end LCDs. It was a weird time. It was like LCDs were the new rage, really big, good LCDs were super expensive, and you could get a better LCD, a TV that, that was a plasma that was better than the best LCD you could get for less money, sometimes significantly less money. So that was really crazy. It was kind of, I, I bought a lot of really bad But anyway, that time I ended plasma all the way. And also the rule for a little while, but then we got into the 4K stuff, and now it's like, uh, is it time for me to get a 4K TV? No, it's definitely not. When will it be? Eh, a couple more years, wait for it to settle down, blah, blah. Like, I think we said this on uh, the podcast, but there's more to 4K than the 4K is, than the fact that there's more pixels, and people get distracted. Bit rate or something? There's different frame rates, there's a wider color gamut. Uh, there, is, it, there are things that are better about it, that are better in ways that, that are significant, that have nothing to do with the fact that there's more pixels. There also happen to be more pixels, but depending on how far you are from your TV, there could be nothing. Uh, visual, you know, human visual acuity is not getting better much faster, so if and when 4K does sort of sweep across the entire line of, of televisions in X number of years, pick whatever number you want for X, I think that'll be it for a while, just based on distance to television, because the distances most people sit from the television 1080p is close to the limits of their uh, their visual perception. But again, what you're getting out of 4K is not just the extra pixels. It's in theory better color, uh, you know, higher dynamic range, uh, different, possibly faster frame rates for things. Uh, so anyway, yeah, now is a terrible time to buy a TV. And when, when people ask, I say, if I had to buy a TV, like if someone came and stole my plasma or something like that, I guess I would probably get the best OLED I can get with the idea that I would sell it within a year because I know the OLEDs that are out now are not good. They're like the really early plasmas where it's like, well, you know, this is a young technology and these are going to be the crappy ones and they're going to be weird about 4K and an HDMI 2.0 and something. But I would still get one because I want something that has a better picture quality than one that's stolen and the only way to get that is with an OLED. And so I would just buy it and say, I know I'm buying this now. I know it's really expensive, but I absolutely am going to sell it in one or two years. And most people don't want to deal with so it's like, well, then, then I say go and get the cheapest TV you can tolerate and just hold out for another few years. Well, what's the, what is the cart and horse situation here? Because I know, so I got a, a, a 5K iMac, so like, but I, I've tried to watch, I've, I've been able to watch like 5K videos I've shot on my phone. They look great, you know, they're big. Uh, 4K videos. Uh, but watching with a 4K video on YouTube, I've got, a, I've got the top of the line iMac. And a really fast connection, and it still snuggers. So I guess I'm wondering, like, as far as the current horse situation, like, how much media will be available in the next year for 4K? I mean, it seems like it'll be worth waiting a year just to see how everything shakes out. Well, most movies are not shot in anything close to 4K still. So any movie that you can think of that exists already and is or has already been shot all the way down to the past, none of those are going to take full advantage. It may take more, you may be able to get more out of them than you get in the 1080p thing, but movies are just not best in the 4K these days. Um, and like I said, it doesn't really matter that much, because if you just do the math with one of those calculators of how big your TV is and how far you sit from it, it might not matter at all. So that's not what you're looking for. Again, mastered for 4K would mean like, oh, we can get more color depth out of the, maybe it was recorded with like a higher color depth than any particular channel. But anyway, I don't know the technical terms, but the idea is you could have a larger range of colors if you went through a, a quote-unquote 4K remaster, even if you didn't, what you didn't get was actually any additional resolution because the original masters uh, didn't have much more resolution to give, but you could get more colors and more dynamic ranges. A lot of these new technologies that are being folded into the 4K standards that have to do with making the brighter spots brighter as compared to the darker spots. Like, if you go outside on a sunny day uh, and you look up at the sun, you can't look at it because it's in the distance. Because uh, <laughs> you go blind and it's really bright. And a television, when they point the camera right at the sun, like someone's stuck in a desert and they show the sun, you can stare right at it, you're fine, right? Now, you don't want to crank it up to the point where it's like the sun and you can't uh, watch it. Never mind, it would probably melt through your house and your eyeballs. Um, but more dynamic range than you can get from current televisions leads to a more realistic, more interesting picture. It can be taken too far, and there's going to be a couple of years where we figure out how to do a higher dynamic range in a way that is not annoying to people, and how they figure out how to master movies for it and everything, but that's that and, and being able to, sp to display more colors um, and higher frame rates if you're into that sort of thing, which potentially could be really good for fixing sports and stuff. That is the next frontier that just happens to come packaged in the, in the UHD.
ADHD or whatever they want to call it these days, that everyone else was called smart I wonder if video games are drawing a lot of that, because, I mean, I don't pretend to understand how you make a video game.
Yeah. Yeah. Can I have a number four large with a diet coke? Is that me off, man? Yep. Have a good night. Thank you.
Thank you. All right. But it seems like you, I could, I could imagine a lot of coming out in 4K <laughs> faster with video games than with new movies. Yeah, uh, because uh, uh, you, there's two things that are going to keep that from happening. To shoot a movie at 4K is just a matter of upgrading your cameras oh, and the rest of your workflow. Uh, yeah. But but to to do a video game, there's two parts that are a problem. One is art assets. Art assets are usually created by humans, even if they're created by humans taking pictures of real things. And creating art assets at higher resolutions is tremendously more expensive. It's kind of like the difference between like doing set design in a world where you're on standard def television and you can just be like, well, I'll just put this box back there and it will totally look like a real crate and really it's made out of cardboard. Whereas once you go HD, you can't put the cardboard back there because it looks like a piece of cardboard, right? right. Um, so the art assets in games, it is much harder to have a group of artists drawing like Oh, draw me the texture I'm going to use on a crate. Model a crate for me. Really low resolution. This looks crate-ish. It's fine, or whatever. But once you crank up the resolution, it's like, I can't just slap something together and call it a crate. It's going to look terrible. I have to start making it. Either we have to pick a stylized thing where it's like cell shaded or some other stylized thing where it's not supposed to look realistic. But if it's supposed to look realistic, like many games are, it's much harder to make that artwork. And it becomes just so much more expensive because any little thing you do, it takes longer to do uh, by people. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, when it comes time to render the game, uh, it's you need more computing power to render higher resolution. And the higher the resolution, the more detailed, the more you need to make the game really reflect that. It's weird to have something that is realistically textured break apart into pieces that look like they're giant Fisher Price pieces because that's not how a real thing would break apart. It, it sort of doesn't match up. So mm -hmm. even today on 1080, there's a lot of games like you know, Halo 5 that just came out this couple of articles about how they dynamically downscale the resolution to maintain the frame rate. They can't even maintain 1080p on modern consoles with this first person shooter. They do behind the scenes when the frame rate starts to get close to dipping, they crank down the resolution to make sure they can keep the frame rate. They're going for 60 frames per second, which is uh, rare for first person shooters. But yeah, I don't, I don't think on PC gaming, 4K type things are already kind of there, but for television console games, I think they'll actually lag behind. Some quality set of textures with the PC, and they're usually pretty darn good, but that's all it, just up to the power that the PC has. For consoles, they don't bother shipping the super high resolution ones because they know it's going to be displayed in 1080p or less, like, and they'll upscale the 1080p. So, like Halo downscales the resolution, it's still showing 1080p in your TV, so it's going to upscale. This episode of Reconcilable Differences is brought to you in part by Backblades. You guys know that place. It's a personal and business backup for Macs and PCs. Backblaze, you get unlimited online backup for documents, music, photos, videos, all your data, and even now, right this minute, you can go and get a no-risk two-week trial at backblaze.com slash differences. I'm running Backblaze right now. Literally, you can hear it. It's, it's right there. It's just running all the time. These people are great. They backed up over 150 petabytes of data, whatever that is. They have restored over 10 billion files, so you have online access to all of your files from internet securely. You know, you've got internet connection. Even have iPhone and Android apps to access all of your smaller files. You can just grab something, just grab it. It just does stop you. You can restore one file at a time on all of your files. It's very easy to web restore. Or get this. You can you can get, get them on the phone. You order yourself one of these USB hard drives in place, you get your entire disk open. So if you ever need to get everything, they can do that for you. They have a native application for Mac and PC. There's not any kind of weird non name stuff happening. There's no names here, but this thing just runs as efficient as like any other process. It's the best. You can back up any of the external drives that you have connected to your computer right now. Often it's like $5 a month. 
even if you're already using the time machine or an external drive, you should use Backblaze as your offset and backup. This is what I do. It's like having a belt and suspenders and then a couple of belts. There's no throttling and no add-ons, there's no gimmicks or additional charges. It's just that five dollars a month for beautiful unlimited unthrottled online backup. Please go ahead and subscribe. It's in the to our new rate where you get a two-week free trial by going to backblaze.com slash differences. Our thanks to Backblaze for supporting reconcilable differences and all of Relay FM. Well I've I've finally stopped saying things like I'll never need something faster than this or I'll never need something better than this or bigger than that. I, that's, that's a phrase I don't know. Good for you. Yeah, that's taken a long time. But, um, but so we've got a f barely over 40 inch TV. It's like a big, small TV. Mm -hmm. they, don't even, they don't even make it that small anymore except for that kitchen top. Well, I don't know. You know, we've had this thing for two or three years and it still feels, in the context of the room that it's in, it feels asinine. And yet, I do wish it were a little bigger. That's so we're looking at maybe getting. I've gotten, I don't know how this happened, but I've gotten clearance to get us a bigger TV. So that's why I'm, I'm shopping around. But the truth is, what you just described, you know, it's funny because I, I really should look into stuff beyond just saying 720, 1080, because I do notice such a difference. Like if I get a cop copy of Dr. Who and fall off the back of a truck, it claims to be 720, it claims to be 1080. Versus what I play, honestly, what I play from the iTunes store, the iTunes store looks I mean, it looks crisp. I don't know if that's some kind of, I don't know what they're doing. Well, I mean, that's, that's the compression, you know, like how much, how compresses it. So the, the final resolution, like, oh, this display is on the frame, it's this number, it takes us this number. Sure, fine. But how heavily compressed is it? You know, right. you, you can just compress the video. Yeah. I mean, it's displayed at that resolution, it still looks like garbage. So that's why one of the reasons the Blu-rays look better is they are less compressed. They're like, Blu-ray movies like 50 gigabytes. So the same movie, if you download an H.264, Blu-ray rip is recompressed to be smaller. You can get a 50 gigabyte Blu-ray down to much smaller sizes, but you just bought it. Yeah, it's always weird when you see that, and you're like, uh, the things that fall off the back of the truck, you'll see two, you know, very similar looking ones, and they're both claimed to be, say, 720 p. And one of them will be 1.4 gigs, one of them will be 3 gigs, one of them will be like 8 or 9 gigs. And of course, then you'll see the occasional 1080p ones that you see, like you say are like 25 or 50 gigs. And uh, I don't know. It's um, you uh, see 1080p ones that are three gigs too. Like it's just it really just depends on the, the settings when they compression and the audio levels as well. They compress audio better than those things. Um, but yeah, it's a, like it's a trade off that you're making when it's the size versus quality. And at a certain point, the whole point of these compression algorithms is they rely on our inability to perceive these differences. But at a certain point, you know, it's yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's funny. I I, uh, I never was much of a size queen when it comes to these kinds of quality. I can always tolerate fairly low uh, and great MP3s. You know, really anything over 160, especially anything over like 192. I'm I'm generally totally fine with that. But man, I, I'm the only one in my house who cares about this. But I will start watching something and I'll just go, like, ah, this is it's just too money. Like, is this? Like, don't, don't you guys see this? I mean, we watch an old episode of like Top Chef. It's in SD. You know, you can watch a room or something, and it just looks so gross. Yeah, the worst are really dark shows like The Walking Dead, or things like Breaking Bad, that like are broadcast over a cable, like multiple uh, television channels shoved into one little skinny you know, area of bandwidth. Yeah, like in a hotel room. Uh, uh, like like no, even even just here, like a hotel room, right? Is worse, but even on this really expensive cable that I pay for from, from Fios, they jam a whole bunch of channels, particularly AMC, for a long time. And they jam into this narrow spread of the, the, the bandwidth spectrum that's coming to our house. And the banding in the shadow areas was crazy. Like, you have this shadowy area around, you know, Don Draper's head on Mad Men or something. And it was just like, oh, like an 8-bit dither from the Mac 2 in, like, 1987. <laughs> it was just, there was, like, four colors. Black. It looks like the Warner Brothers logo, like a yeah, target. Yeah, <laughs> dotty brown. And it would shimmer and move and wave. And, and that's not I because... I hate that. It drives me nuts. That's not because of the quality of your television. And that's not because of... The compression out well it is compression out like they, they just they needed this this show to be as small as possible to fit in the allotted spots and whatever their bandwidth thing is they compress the hell out of it it looks like crap and so if you were to get Mad Men on Blu-ray and look at that same scene it's like ah, like I did. at a certain point it becomes distracting like I try not to notice it and generally I don't but at a certain point like you notice it it's as if it's suddenly the, the thing has become cell shaded or posterized yeah, I remember one time a few years ago, uh, I don't listen to her, listening on Twitter, um, 
like when you, when you, you know, the, the unforgettable HBO credit uh, comes up. You know, all the all the static. It's like I think I'm going to talk about the one where the little white lights spin around the chrome O in the HBO. Remember that one? Oh yeah, back in the day. Yeah. But you know, he's asking, you know, what is the show when you hear when you see and hear that? What is the theme song you imagine coming on? It's really interesting to see if everybody's different ones. For me, it's still Mr. Show or Sex in the City. Oddly enough. I still expect to hear more, maybe Curb and Enthusiasm. But you know what's funny is that <laughs> that, uh, what do you call that? What's the term for that? The credit, the beginning. The wrong person to ask. But uh, you know where I'm going with this probably. It comes up and it's, it's this HBO like, feature presentation or something. And it's just an incredibly complex pattern of static. But like it renders like crap. On, on everything, because <laughs> you know it's like when you watch water or leaves, you know, in a movie. Like you see all of them, like artifacts, I guess you call it. Yeah. Well, the, the, the compression algorithms break the image, most of them break the image down into regions that they can try to reason about and say, I can't tell you everything that's in this region, but I can come up with some sort of formulation that will reproduce what's in this region using less space than if I had told you the, the color of every single piece. Right? Yeah. And static is like the worst case scenario because how do you characterize it? It's like, well, it's totally chaotic. This, this region's got a lot of crap in it. There's some white, and there's some black, and there's no real pattern to them. So how do you approximate that without saying, this one's white, that one's black, this one's black, that one's white. How do you approximate that? And so that it really shows the compression. Because the compre like, think of the, the detail of the transition from dark to light. How many transitions and hard edges from dark to light are there in static, especially artificial static? Like it's not real static, they're, they're simulating it, they're just making noise. Yeah. It is the worst case scenario for compression. So I thought you were going to say that a, a generation of people seeing the static EHBO logo have never seen legit static in their oh, life right. on their television. Oh, God. So true. Well, last night, uh, we were watching Fargo last night, and there's this really gorgeous overhead shot of, like, what, Aspen? Or streets? Probably Aspen trees. From above. It's just gorgeous. You see the snow, you see the bare Aspen trees, and the shadow that's being cast by them. It's, it's really, really beautiful. Moving image in the movie scene, and um, but there was this was the word uh, what was the ending to it like a sort of like Misa or more you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I don't know how to pronounce the word, but, but you know, like like it's like when they tell you don't wear like a striped shirt. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. don't wear a horizontally striped shirt. It's gonna look your shirts here. Right? And uh, it's man, yeah, I only noticed it at times like that. I, I can mostly live with that. I just you know I, I hate the rays. I, and I can tolerate these streaming services. We pay for Hulu, you know, with no commercials. Hulu with no commercials. Netflix, HBO, Amazon Prime. These things all the various movies and stuff we buy on iTunes. I forget the ones. But you know, it's it's mostly it's mostly pretty okay. But I I do not want to have a future where I go back to the old last discs. That just that feels like defeat to me. I still buy the Blu-rays because I'm still I demand to have the highest quality version of movies that I care about. So I got and, Inside and Out. Is, and there is, there is a difference. There absolutely is a difference. Yeah, and I, I got Inside Out on Blu-ray, but we made sure we got the one that has the digital iTunes copy included. So when the kids watch it, they watch it off the Apple TV on iTunes. But I feel better knowing we have a good one. And when I watch my Miyazaki movies, they're generally not available to get away because except for iTunes, but I definitely watch them off the Blu-ray and I have the kids watch them off the Blu-ray too. Um, hmm. What's um? What are some of your favorites in terms of like how it turned out on the Blu-ray? Like, are, are there are there some where you feel like like you know I we talked about the Godfather on here before the the restoration of the Godfather and how many people were frustrated with the noise and all of that. Are there certain things that that you think look particularly good on Blu-ray versus other media, or are they all just uniformly equally better? Well, it's it's difficult to say because the ones that stand.
such a nice balance of uh, darker themes, but not making them ridiculous. Um, and but I'm still having like what we love, the joy, the joyfulness of the first one. You know what I mean? And, and we're freaking all that for fucking doing slapstick. Yeah, and and it, and it, it grew in sophistication with like the sort of the, the rough outline of the characters laid down in the book was still there, and it just cranked it up a little bit, a little bit more clever writing and thinking and acting. And if you read those, uh, Wisner or something, the gigantic making up coffee table books. Oh, those are terrific. Yeah, which are excellent. And just read about Empire and the people who were involved, and from the actors to, to you know the director himself to Lucas and everyone else thinking about how each scene would play out, it seemed like they were on top of their game in terms of clear-headed thinking about what makes for believable characters and a good scene and the right amount of drama and just, they were concerned about all the right things and not concerned about all, you know, they talk so little about spaceships and lasers. They, they get the people right, but they also, the relationships are positive and the, the motivations are positive. Like, yeah, like and, you, you care about what you believe what those people feel. You, you see it on the screen. And I think it's an unusually uh, subtle and assured attempt at, you know, showing these relationships and these, these fancy movie characters. Yeah, and I was really struck by, like, how the actors were bring like, to, to the scene. In, in a way, that, like, I guess maybe, uh, maybe, maybe it only happens after the actors have a little bit of uh, more stature, like, because they Star Wars together, and I forget by that point Harrison Ford wasn't in the films yet, but uh, like, and they come in and they have ideas about what their character might do or say, or how this might be played, or you know, different line readings, stuff like that. And it's you know, it's a bunch of people all contributing a little bit of tension of like each one fighting for their character to do the right thing, and the director mediating between them. But it's like you're struck by how much all the people involved in these things care about the scene in a way that you think like simply like oh they just show up and it's like you know have some fun with my gun and you know, write this stuff for like, you can't paint it or whatever and like oh you this weird space movie and Alec Guinness was so famously like dismissive of Star Wars or whatever but like you know reading about the, the you know the carbonite scene and the whole you know I love you uh, I know business and how they play off each other and how like the, the tension in the scenes and the lay of Falcon that the actors were invested in giving good performances and making these believable characters and had actual input, like positive input, into the final result in a way that you wouldn't expect to be just like, oh, it's one of those silly space movies and they're just in it to get their paycheck. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's funny because the reports, I, I, you know, I haven't followed the stuff as closely as you, but it sounds like uh, Guinness's relationship was uh, somewhere between... <laughs> Confused and fraught. Uh, you know, Grandma of Tarkin, uh, Peter, uh, Peter. What's his name? I Grandma never Tarkin. know. I never know the actor's name. It's not a tool. Peter Cushing. Peter Peter Cushing supposedly had one okay. of the most famous. Like I, I do, what do these words mean? He was there for a very short. I remember I read this in the. Oh God, it's, the, the the big coffee table book about the first movie. Uh, and, and just it sounded like he was not around for more than a few days, and he just didn't, and he's like, what is, <laughs> like, what is happening here? What do these lines mean? Yeah, but the, the, the great thing about a, uh, a workman-like British actor is they yep. come in, they read the lines, they get the job done, they do the best job they can do, and we look at him and we're like, wow. Oh, he's, he, he totally sold it. The scenes, like with him and Princess Leia, are so great. It's, I, I feel like he, he, he and Guinness have lent so much gravitas to that movie. Even and, though they don't care, give a damn about it, and have, right. no, and have no understanding of it, and it's not their generation, they do the job that they're hired to do, and they do it well. Yeah, on the one hand, Guinness wrote these letters at home, I, I think I saw one of the letters he wrote about like this ridiculous movie that he's in. But then on the other hand, he supposedly uh, bought everybody drinks on the last day. Sounds like a gentleman. Yeah, no, they're just, they're just they're there to do a job. Yeah. This episode of Reconcilable Differences is brought to you in part by Casper. To learn more about Casper right now, please visit casper.com slash diffs. That's casper.com slash D-I-F-F-S. Let me lay this out for you real easy. Casper is a company that offers an obsessively engineered mattress that is shockingly fabulous. Casper's mattress is one of a kind. It's a new kind of hybrid mattress that combines premium latex foam with just the right sink, 
just the right balance as the two technologies come together for better nights and brighter days. I have personally, in my actual home, in my actual bed, not to be kidding, I've been sleeping on a Casper mattress for over a year before employing this thing. I love the quality of this product, I've been looking forward to the sleep that I get. You know what? I don't feel a lot of the obligations that I would do to feel. 
Um, and that is a difficulty because other people have the expectation of you, but if you don't have an expectation of yourself, then, you know, you're going to visit this number of people, and, like, if you visit this person at this time, you got to visit that person, or, like, you got to you gotta stop off at both people's houses on Christmas or all four people, and you got to buy these people presents for these people's kids, and, you know, like, all those different rules and obligations, I don't, I don't feel like, I, I don't feel obligated by them, so very often, if I, if I don't comply with them, other people see me as being a terrible person, which maybe I am. But, like, from my perspective, like, there's, there's, a, there's a difference in expectations. There's a difference in the mental model of what, what I think people would expect of me and what I think is reasonable to do. Um, so when I hear about other people's experience of, like, it's a holiday, I have to go to relative X and relative Y with all of my kids. And if I don't, my family will be spent. Like, I have to do it. I have to go to these people's parents' house, those people's parents' house, with all the kids, and I hate it, and I dread it, and it's like, it's like you're ruining your own holiday to fulfill the obligations put upon you by your family to do something you don't want to do. Like, it's not a problem. It's not a vacation. And yet, they do it. Maybe they're just overblowing it. Like, I really don't hate it that much. They're just like, oh, you know, I gotta go see my family, whatever. But I just wouldn't do it. And I guess my family would never speak to me again if I had the type of family. It just seems, it just seems alien to me. Hmm. I don't know if you, have you ever felt that kind of, like, like that, that other people in your family, extended or immediate family, expect certain things to happen on a holiday, and if it was up to you, you wouldn't do so Well, at the risk of revealing too much about my, my own birth and interior world, there's, there's a phrase I, that I use when we're talking about traveling, with, you know, where you're worried about the happiness and well-being and everybody on the trip with you, like if you're by yourself, you don't care, with your kids. What I mean, the phrase that I use uh, unfelicitously is that it's a scene exposure. So, you know, when you go on a trip and things don't like just your view, when you go on a trip and things don't go well, the kid's sick, or you can't find a place to breastfeed, or the food's all gross and expensive, like, that all in itself, that's just facts in the world that shouldn't mean anything. But, but A, they do accumulate. And then B, as they accumulate, the stress rises. And, you know, all of these sort of, like, things that might have been bubbling under the surface can come, can come up. And at least I feel very self-conscious about my confidence in a situation like that. And I feel very kind of sensitive that like I'm, not, I'm doing a bad job. So in the same way that I feel that when traveling, um, without any provocation from anybody else, I very much feel that way with confidence. Like I feel like I'm very rarely doing all I can do uh, in all these things to make the situation better. And then I, I fret about it. It doesn't even take anybody being a jerk about it. I, I would do that to myself. But it, it doesn't hurt when people do. So you worry that you are not providing an adequate holiday for the rest of the people who are depending on you to do that? Well, yes and no. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, kind of, yes. I mean, for example, like, it's just never... Uh, it's, it's, from the point of view... And this is just my... I, there are not people saying this to me. They may be saying this to me in the back. They're not saying this to me, but like... You know, your family could always use more time with your kid, right? Um, anybody, like, you know, I'll be in that same position someday, God willing. If, if I go long enough, I will probably hope I can see my kid more and see her family more and so forth. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not so damn as to say that I'll never be in that position. But that's why I use that phrase I put here on the list under holidays, the uh, producer versus consumer. That's the way I think about work a lot. You know, we think about work, there are the people who produce stuff and people some stuff, and that disparity is complicated. There's somebody who wants a lot of stuff, or somebody who wants to make a lot of stuff, that can be really complicated. And especially when your kids are young, uh, there's a fair amount, when you're young, there's a fair amount of pressure to participate and to be there for things. And even if that's not like an obvious or overt thing, I still feel a lot of guilt about it. I still, I, I don't know, I, sometimes holidays can be a little stressful for me. So are you producing two children and then the cheek pictures are consuming those two children? Is this the dynamic? Could be, but I mean the most obvious way to look at it is, let's say, you know, uh, like I think about it in my wife's family. Like she's got this one, one brother who's kind of the de facto head of the family. Like as far as I know there was never a vote about this, <laughs> there was never a meeting about this, but and he's not like an alpha guy, but he's like the dad of the brothers. 
like he is the guy where like stuff just gets accomplished. And not to say anybody else doesn't participate. There isn't. I mean, every it's a great family. Kids don't get the wrong. But to make the point that I need to make, I'm just I'm stipulating that in in many situations there's somebody who ends up being almost like the alpha dog. And that's not what I mean. Because it's not about power. It's about execution. But there's always like the first person who's there to step in to help. Like when your grandma breaks her hip, yeah, come stay with me. Even though we've already got other people staying. It's that kind of giving and giving and giving person who I would say is in that case one of the producers. Of, of the, the family stuff. And then there are the people who are the consumers of stuff who will come along and, you know, oh, maybe they picked up a pie at the store and stuff like that. But, you know, one aspect that I really admire about the producers in that case is that they often kind of really bitch about their position. Just, that's, that's kind of just how they are, a lot of them. And uh, that said, that role in a lot of families is frequently filled by women. Uh, who end up being the ones who have to, and you know, I don't know how many like large holiday like events you've hosted at your house, but it's a lot of work. It's pretty expensive, and it can be extremely stressful uh, because you really find yourself basically you are the host, you are the person who's to care of all of them. So you know, uh, I, I, I think about that, and I think about like how I could be more of a producer and less of a consumer, which makes me kind of just feel worse about it sometimes. But you know, it's if you want to be good at this stuff, it can't be something that occurs to you towards the end of the year. It needs to be something more, you know, in the fiber of how you are and how you conduct yourself. It isn't the kind of thing where you can, like, you know, strap on a Santa pair and suddenly, you know, it's out. It's more like, you know, are you that kind of person or are you not? Because there's some people who are that person and uh, they just end up doing, you know, just a tremendous amount of work. There's a lot of expectations. And what you touched on there, I think, is some people who are in that position of, like, arranging everything um, or put themselves in that position of arranging everything. Maybe doing it because, and, and I've, I haven't found myself doing this like the last person to ever do it. People who are these things because they're trying to reproduce a, the holidays of uh, experience of their youth. Like when I was a kid, um, one set of grandparents was like 30 minutes away, the other set was two hours away, lots of my relatives were 30 minutes away, plus lots of aunts and uncles and great aunts and great uncles. Pretty close together, all things considered. The suburbs next to the magical Levittown, and you know, a bunch of Italians moving from the city out to the island, and all like, I mean, my grandfather, you know, I had relatives who lived three houses in a row next to each other, right? Because that's wow, for real, yeah, like they wow. came from, from, from you know, the, the GI Bill and all the other stuff after World War II, they come from the city out to the island, and you get houses, and you get a house next to your cousin, next to your brother, like just three in a row, and then like other people, you know. In the other town over around like so when we had holidays good holidays with a lot of people or just this one set of grandparents all the fans and uncles and cousins all the time not that far away not a long drive even just not even for holidays just for no reason going to see grandma and grandpa this weekend right like it wasn't like it was when you were kind of losing the same house but it was kind of like a median point between uh, where you are now and it was like, spread out much more um so if you try to like reproduce that where every Christmas has at least like one entire, like which side of the family is going to be, or are we going to be with for Christmas? And it'll be like the entire side of the family, like all the brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and grandparents and, and cousins, as many as can come, like you fill the house with a bunch of, you know, time. And, <laughs> and, and, and that was your holiday experience. And some people feel like anything less, like especially when they have kids, I want my kids to know all their cousins and to hang out with them and to know all their aunts and uncles and to have a million presents from all their different relatives. But if you live in a situation that is not like that, where every single one of your brothers and sisters and parents and cousins and uncles lives in a different state, right, across the entire country, that's just not going to happen. And if you're determined to make that happen, that can cause tensions because you're like, oh my god. Am I not providing my kids with the kind of holidays that I had when I was a kid? Right. Um, and the kids don't. Well, they only know what they know, right? They'd much rather have it. Yeah, and, I, I, get your, I, I, get, I get what you're saying. I'd like, you know, But it's funny because we're always doing it's like a game of telephone, a game of emotional you know, telephone, where, you know, we, you know, we grow up watching these certain TV shows or having these certain traditions. And when you're a kid, you know, there are some kinds of tensions and weirdnesses that you're aware of, and many, many, many that you're not. That, you, that will not occur to you 
until you've left for college and had time to really think about it and go, oh, wow, this person was born six months after their parents married. That's super interesting. You know what I'm saying? You do those weird kinds of math where you realize, like, there's all these little, little puzzle pieces that you fit together. But I get what you're saying, which is that, like, without realizing it, you know, you... And again, it's... I, I, I hate to be on Charlie Brown about this, but there is something, like, somewhat melancholy about the holidays in a lot of ways. Anyhow, well, especially, you know, the, the winter holidays, for a variety of reasons. But one of them is this strange feeling of, like, it's a weird combination of nostalgia and imagined nostalgia and aspirational nostalgia. So it's like, it's, there's what you had, there's what you wish you had, and what you hope other people could get. And when all these things come together, I think it's not a new at all. That can be very emotional and exciting and difficult sometimes. But, you know, in the, in the case of her, just to be clear, in the case of her brother, he's difficult. Like, like he's been hurt. Like, um, he's just, like, when people die in the family, like, he's just collapsing. Like, he just shows up places. And the guy's really busy. He, like, runs a but he's just one of those, like, you know, you get these people in life, they're just like a super person. You get these people who are just like, I, I can't even imagine, I, I'm exhausted after picking my kid up from school and buying her a sandwich, and I'm just laying on the floor with the iPad because I'm exhausted, and this guy's like jetting around the country. There's just those kind of people where I don't think it is an overt, like, you know, I want to be seen in this way. It's just that's how they're cut out. Yeah, no, I think, I think where it goes wrong is where people really do want their kids to have the holiday experience they had. But better. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but you can't because those people aren't around and JR doesn't agree with it and that they feel bad about it and that they try. Like, they, I'm going to try to do that and I'm going to be upset when it doesn't happen and when this relative bails on me and says they don't want to fly across the country or, you know, can't afford it or doesn't want to host us over there or whatever, just be like, don't you understand that? Like, sometimes people are aware this is going on that they really want to have. And I felt, like I said, I felt the same thing early on. It was like, I eventually, fairly quickly, came to terms with the idea that my kids are going to have a different experience of family than I did, and that's fine because they have nothing to compare it to. Like, as long as they feel like they're, you know, they have a family, an immediate family that loves them and relatives care about them, it's like maybe they want to see them more often than they do because we live far away and you try to make it happen as best as you can by getting rid of that shame about it. Like, the differences between your childhood and theirs. It doesn't bother me um, almost at all, even though my kids are having a very different experience of all their relatives and uh, all their life experiences. But I, I understand where people are coming from with that. And even if it's not something that you had, even if it's like something you didn't have and you always imagined that your kids would have, maybe you grew up all alone and you were an only child and you had no relatives and your holidays were only with your parents and you were still living with your Your kids had a holiday with an extended family, so you have an extended community.
lugging luggage around and kids and fighting for overhead bin space and braving traffic in the snow to get to and from some relative's house. Maybe you just take it off here. And again, this top, top of ten is coming out. I would like to do that for every holiday and never see anybody and just stay in my little hobbit hole, right? So there's that tension against like what the rest of the world expects and I just have to sort of you know, walk that line, but for a lot of people, when I hear these horror stories, I'm like, aren't, you know, I guess you could just view holidays as another, like, thing that you have to do for work, it's just like a different kind of work, and I'm not yeah. saying, like, totally disengage from your family, but if you have any kind of dysfunction like that, where you legitimately are dreading your holiday, not in a ha-ha, I'm not dreading the holidays, but in a legit way, where you're dreading, because that's, you know, all the people have, like, the, the suicide around Christmas and New Year's is so hard, but for yeah. people, this really is a horrible time of year, and just, this makes me sad that something something that could and should be enjoyable has just turned so much for so many people. This is supposed to be a happy occasion. Let's yeah, not, not, let's not bicker and argue about who killed who. Um, yeah, I have a lot to say about this. Um, you know, one thing is, just to be clear, when I um, was talking about holidays and vacations, this was part of it. I, I didn't mean to just make it about, like, the golden word of Christmas. I also was just curious about, you know, just as a foot double dagger here, like, just kind of how you feel about the whole idea of time off, you know, as it gets to work. Circle back to that, but um, yeah, you know, I have actually so much to say. But another part of this is that I think I think one of these slightly dangerous, slightly dangerous, slightly damaging um, myths, like useful myths, is that you know when you grow up, unless you're really like, well, let's just put it this way, unless you're a lot smarter than or something. Game. No, you, it's fine. So, that, you're making me feel bad about 
<laughs> the holidays I'm producing for me. I guess you, what you're talking about for, the, for this being a little bit sad, you're talking about in your adult life or even in your childhood memories that you have of this teenage of life of the Catholic Church. Okay, so, I mean, trying to take it from the, the easy to get to feelings to the more difficult to tease out feelings. Uh, there's always that feeling of like, oh, I want to get my kids something cool. Let's let's go with the really dumb stuff. I want to get my kids something really cool for Christmas, but I don't want to buy a bunch of junk just to buy junk. I want to make these memorable experiences, but I don't want to manufacture experiences. I don't want to go to a blog about Christmas and learn about new traditions I can introduce. I want to I want to like be able to honor uh, things about about our family without fetishizing it in a way that we would not do 364 other days. Ago. There's all these kind of balanced things that you don't have to think about until it's kind of upon you. So there's that. And there's just kind of working down the line of, like, in my case, you know, I'm going to be 49 next week. Excuse me, this week. Uh, so, yeah, I'm intensely aware more and more of, like, uh, you know, I'm moving into a different demo. I'm, I'm in a very different demo now. I, I don't mind it. It's, it's fun to, like, you know, make jokes about it and be old and stuff like that. It's fine. It makes you happy. But, like, but I can tell you that, like, it is, it is different to get a little bit older and to see, to have seen these things go by a few times and uh, you get a real different feel for them. In the same way that my kid, you know, my kid's had, you know, eight spring cards at this point and I've had, I've had 48. That's a, that's a real different kind of thing. When you see that, that cycle over that kind of time, I'm not sure what it is. That's a You start singing Sunrise Sunset at the music video. <laughs> I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is like the, the, the things that most of us can't access if we're being honest is that it's not, even if you are a very self-aware, mentally, emotionally healthy person, it is, it's not difficult to feel a little bit stressed out over the holidays for whatever reason. Whether the people think that's good or bad, like we all have our own personal demons about the kinds of feelings we have at a time of year that so heavily fetishizes a certain kind of molten familial and I, I think it would be cynical not to acknowledge that that's something a lot of people struggle with. Um, so I guess part of what I'm saying is maybe I, I'm probably lobbying for the Wabi Sabi Christmas and the idea that, you know, accepting that that, that sadness and, and brokenness and weirdness, you know, think about the think, think about Christmas story. And like when... Um, I, I was going to say, when you said Wabi Sabi Christmas, not this, this not to be in but like, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of, like, favorite... Christmas television uh, or movie related things that end with a Christmas that is not ideal, but that we are led to believe through the story is a good Christmas after all these families together and they make the best of a bad situation. So if you're there and you're having the, you know, the, the peeking duck for Christmas and they chop the head off for you, that far, rah, 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 rah. E even though it doesn't seem like the Christmas, the normal Rockwell Christmas, in a way it is. It's the new style normal Rockwell Christmas. is like the house burned down, but we're all okay, and in the end it was a good Christmas after all, and yes, it does snow, but you know what I mean, like, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, Christmas movies that are like that, even, even the Charlie Brown Christmas, or whatever, making the best of a bad situation, and deciding that actually, you know, the most important thing about Christmas is blah, 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 right, but the, the, the shepherds were with, abiding in the fields, yeah, it, it doesn't end with the picture perfect Christmas, it ends with the Christmas that's all messed up, but it ends with mostly happy music, and people being so there is a, there is a that is so like that, that you shouldn't make the best of it. But I feel like in real life, if Christmas doesn't go off well and people get in a big argument, very rarely does that day end with everybody sort of oh. snuggling down together and realizing, you know what, if the dishwasher exploded and the roof was leaking, but in the end we had a good Christmas. Like I, I haven't <laughs> seen that. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, in some ways, Christmas becomes the emotional swimsuit season, like where you can really try and prepare yourself for how you're going to look in the harsh beach light of uh, <laughs> familial uh, Christmas sunlight, but you know, you really can. It's Again, if that's not how you conduct yourself every day, it's not going to completely change just because the calendar flips any more than your New Year's traditional schedule because it's January 1st. Um, so, yeah. I have to say that you kind of made me, like I said, it kind of made me feel guilty of it. When I think back to my childhood Christmases, I don't feel any I don't know if they were perfect. I was just so self-obsessed at that point. And like, they're just golden memories in terms of like, if other people are having problems and we're stressed about stuff, 
I didn't care because all I cared about was it was like it really was magical like especially the ones the ones I have the best memories of and again going back to the family things where we would on Christmas Eve we would go over to my aunt and uncle's house in Queens and play music and sing songs together none of our family could sing except for like three or four people so it was pretty terrible it was hilarious you know do the 12 days of Christmas and have the signature dishes that each relative makes uh, for the occasion and drive back home knowing that as soon as we get home in the sleepy car ride uh, coming back from Queens that we're going to go right into our beds and drift off to sleep because we will be legit tired from having a busy day and we'll wake up in the morning and it will be Christmas and there will be exciting things for me um, and it's all it's all good and uh, of course you can't have that experience as anything close to an adult or even an adolescent you can only have it as a very young child um, and at a certain point that magic fades and I, I was okay with it fading at that point I was like bitter and cynical 13 or 14 year old or whatever right? right right but then like now you turn it around and you see the world through the eyes of your child and like am i giving my kid any experience that even comes close to that should i even try or are they having their own magical experience it's very different than the latter i mean it's ruining it entirely and my kids will never have i mean i have to think that every parent of every generation in addition to feeling like you know the kids these days feels the opposite and that they feel like their childhood was more idyllic and perfect and that they'll never be able to provide that for their kids because they don't live on a farm anymore or yeah they didn't have a pet dog or they didn't have they didn't kill squirrels with a pocket knife or whatever it is of their memories of children <laughs> childhood oh every christmas we go squirreling <laughs> yeah, it doesn't fit in the modern world and they're like right. but they're never gonna have the christmas that yeah, i have but, like, yeah but on the one hand we never did i mean we were at that point we were still you know in this like you know what fifth generation you know, post Dickensian idea. And I just want to also underscore the word Dickensian. Like, <laughs> part of what makes a Christmas Carol, like, moving is it's Dickens. And it's got a bunch of sad people and a crippled kid in it. And it's like, it, it, it is really sad. But to your point, I think it is, there's the heightened feeling and the heightened awareness of being a little kid at Christmas and noticing everything. And I'm not going to do it because I don't want to cry on a podcast, but like thinking about certain things from my childhood, you know, uh, like around uh, family members dying and stuff. Uh, and like, you know, getting through that Christmas, that's fun. But you know, the, some of the things I really remember, like I remember being at church in 1977 and coming outside after the Christmas Eve service and it was snowing. And it really did feel like something out of a TV show, which is exactly how I would have described it at the time and how I would describe it now. And, but you know, I, I have such clear recollections of what gifts I got, what years, but also just that mix. And again, I think you can't have Christmas without this mix. And herein lies the healthiness, is realizing that all of that, like, if your heart only uniformly feels good about it, um, I mean, that's good, and that's a happy, healthy thing for people, but like, part, I guess what I'm trying to, struggling to get at is that it's actually that combination of, of happiness and sadness, of elation and like desperation, of like uh, gains and loss. I don't like that this train seems to be slowing down, uh, yet it is very long and in our path. yards or so and we should be okay
ですか Sinking video after the left camera stopped.
sunset right now. <laughs> Sorry. But that, I think you can't really appreciate what a holiday like this can do for you unless you're open to the fact that that is a real mixed bag. Yeah, and even if the even mixed bag is offset by time, so my, my perfect childhood Christmases are paired with these future Christmases in which I look back on those Christmases and realize I'm never going to have one of those again. And so that Christmas is like informed by the past Christmas and becomes bittersweet in a certain way. This episode of Reconcilable Differences is brought to you in part by Mail Route. You can learn more about Mail Route right now by visiting mailroute.net slash diffs. That's the best term. So who do you want to search for? Fox News or the legitimate email while we're being paid. Mail Route simply helps its interest in large universities and corporations. Hey, IT really like minded nerd. They have built all of their tools with you. Please take a minute and go to mailroute.net and see So, like, um, I, uh, I'm not about to get all focused about this, because uh, that would be a Christmas thing to do, but sort of like we talked about in Game of Travel, and I, I think you and I reached something like a reconciliation of this, but that idea that, like, let's be honest, that I do better in any situation when I get my head out of my ass, and I realize that I can always choose to make, I can choose to be a better person, and I can choose to do that just because I want to make it better for other people, not just because I want to feel better about myself. Like, you know, choosing to be selfless because it makes you feel good about yourself is not a great reason to be selfless. And so when it comes to it's something the like only way to be selfless. And, and this now we're getting closer to the no, world. There's no way to be selfless. Which is not when possible. you have time off with your family, is what I really meant. And so, like, to me, this goes back to what we talked about travel, which is, like, if I get my head out of my ass and I say, look, let's, let, let's, let's repeat this phrase again until it becomes our catchphrase. Don't forget this is supposed to be fun. Or it doesn't have to be a nightmare. It's only, it, it, we make it worse when we you know, toss on all this emotional coal to make this something that, that is difficult. And again, I, I can do that myself. I'm great at that. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I know how to make myself feel bad without any provocation. I'm super good at that. But like, again, like for me, that means getting to a point where I go, like you said, sort of like when you go to Disney World, that's not your opportunity to play, you know, uh, Cesar the dog handler and have your kids be perfect. It's your, it's your chance to like pull back a notch on discipline and be mellow without being, without it turning into a madhouse. So for me, that means like I'm, what I'm trying to get better at is get a better clutch about getting into a holiday faster and more completely, becoming less selfless about the time that I spend on that, on, on, on like, you know, worrying about my own nonsense and to find the right balance of keeping it on the rails and 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 being a uh, being a, a producer rather than just a consumer of fun and like i know I, I have successfully made holidays sound like work but like i think that's good work and that's a way to be a dad in some ways is to like get your get out of your own thing and try and make it good for other people and keep it moving even if it's not going perfectly because that's part of the fun that's the stories that you're going to remember yeah I I find that thinking about how, at least how my kids experience holidays is mostly counterproductive. Because in the end, I really have no idea, and they have no idea until they look back on it. So I'm just kind of like doing the best I can with fingers crossed. With the adults, that there are like fraught relationships among the, the extended family between adults, there's only so much I can do about that. I can try to be helpful and supportive and not make things worse, but. Like, at a certain point, there are certain things that just have to be endured, you know what I mean? Like, the, the oh, family yeah. obligation is that certain people are going to all be together, and there are certain unresolved issues amongst those people, legitimate or not, and whether or not you have a stake in them, or are asked to take a side, or anything like that. Like, there's only so much you can do for that, and that, that's the case where it's like, are, you're not going to solve this, just try not to make it worse, and it's difficult. Well, here's, here's another one that, I, I don't know, I'm genuinely, genuinely curious what you think of this, but like... If you think about it, when you're, and I, I think we've both, we, we've both talked about this, and I think we struggle with this in different ways, is like not giving your nonsense to your kids. Like not giving your kids your anxieties, or however you want to phrase it, that like you want to let your kids, like like as you said so much, these are the genetics of who your kids are and how they are. Like they're going to become how they are. But again, now you've got this magnifying glass of Christmas, so what happens? Now you go, oh, I'm a parent now. I've got a kid. I would like them to have a nice Christmas. Now, even if you're not like an, an, an idiot who's like trying to like artificially create this entire like you know 
movie about Christmas for your kids, you still can't help but feel, I want you to have a Christmas as good as I had at my best Christmas. But like, I also, I want to be in the business of, of creating a good experience for you. When you're doing that, or I feel like when I'm doing that, there is a part of me that is not empty. There's a part of me that's like, there's this past version of myself that happens to be in this body that's kind of like, oh man, what can I do to make an eight-year-old's kid, an eight-year-old kid's Christmas really great? Which at a point is good, because you're, you're open to the idea of like, what, what would be fun for your family, or what would be memorable, or enjoyable, or however you think of it for your family. But that's actually only a couple steps away from being a child with a partially completed emotional master's degree. You're basically like an advanced child at that point, and you have to be careful because now you have the vulnerabilities of a child. And if you get disappointed by how Christmas went, you're basically a petulant middle-aged child now. And that's the tough part, is where you go like, how do I make this not about me to make this whatever it's going to be for people, you know, without making it my, my hanger, my people. That's a Christmas TV and movie special trope as well, where there's the adult, they always have, that's another very common thing, they have the adults who's pressing, who's pressing to have, to make the perfect holiday for his family, and there's always a scene where the pressing comes to a head, and one of the little kids being the wise adult in the movie, and one of those random little kids says, Dad, you know, I don't care about whatever it is that you're really upset about, I'm just like you, not to be like, what is your story with the, uh, the Christmas where you got the really good buzz light year? Is that what you're trying to do? That was and such then, a good Christmas, and all she remembers is me cursing. It was such a good Christmas. She got the best presents. Like we really nailed it. Like really, really good presents. But like the tree was great. Everything went great. But like what she remembers of that is me trying to get Buzz and Woody out of the wires that held them into the package. And that's I think that's the first time that she remembers me actively cursing. Yeah, because like it, what you think you're coming away with Christmas, this is the Christmas where you got all the great things and everything is perfect. And <laughs> Goddamn Buzz that, Lightyear. That's the Christmas when Daddy got really mad. Yeah, and I, I mean, I was it was frustrating. And and, and, and you were pressing at that point. It's like it's like I want this to be perfect and everything yeah. would be perfect if only this damn toy would come out of the box. And like even things screws now too, like actual screws. No, literal screws. And like I I, I wish I had taken a photo of it, John, because I know, I if know. you could appreciate like what it took to get somebody. You know, the, like the wire wrapped in guns they use, like the ones that do the twisting. Obviously, that's not a human doing it. It's a machine that takes those things, twist them. Like, there's the screws and there's the wires, and they're twisted 8,000 times around. And you gotta get out the wire cutters if you don't want to untwist those for them. This reached a nadir in her birthday last month, where a friend of hers gave her one of those, uh, one, of those uh, one of those creepy, skinny, like ghost teenage dolls. Like the creepy yeah. high school girls' uh, dolls. Is it Monster High? Monster High. Great. Now we've got that. Like, uh, like this, this, if this doll were scale size, she would be 5'8 and like 90 pounds, maybe. It's like the, the Nightmare Before Christmas proportion. It's a good pumpkin head. And I, I, I get how they want to look good on the shelf, but there were so many wires and rubber bands. There were no screws in this case. Thank God they're doing two on the nose. But like, it, it took me like 20 minutes to remove this gift I didn't even know how to have. It was heartbreaking. I'm very familiar with those dolls on the package. Does, does, your, your, does your girl like this? That's not the thing I think about in terms of all this. Like, the issue of taste? <laughs> gift bag specifically. No. Volume of toys. Oh, God, right? yes. When I look back on my childhood, I always feel like, and I think this is actually the really true, that both my parents had better jobs than we did. Basically, like, you know, as you hear all the BS about it, this is the first generation, you know, generation X, the first generation of not doing as well as their parents. Not that my parents were super rich, but in the grand scheme of things, they had better jobs than we had, just because there were better jobs back then. Like, in terms of, like, they started off at lower pay, but they ramped up, and they had one job their entire careers, and they spent their entire careers working for the government, and got ridiculous pensions that don't even freaking exist anywhere. Like, their pensions are crazy. Healthcare, pensions, like, it just seemed, it just non-existent, right? So by the time we kids were getting to the age to remember anything, their pay was pretty good, their benefits were pretty good, their job security was really good, and it just feels like they had more than we have, at least in terms of security. And yet, we got way fewer things. We had fewer toys. We had less expensive toys. Anytime I wanted an expensive toy, it was a big deal, and I would often have to contribute and, you know, put money towards these things, and it was like, I don't know how much stuff my kids had. And I'm like, 
I don't even think that this is stuff. Adjusted for inflation, maybe, maybe I make, I don't know. Do I make as much as my parents used to? I've never done the math on it, but it just seems like our kids have way more stuff. And, yeah. and that's just like choosing, I mean, spoiling our kids. It was, it, you know, the whole puritanical thing of like, you should, you'll have a rock in your life and that's your toy. You get one dollar and if you break it, that's it. And you know, and the whole idea of like, always wanting to give your children a better childhood than you had, and that just keeps scaling up and up and up. But again, you, 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 when you do that, or when I do that, I'm giving, I mean, I'm kind of giving a, a, a gift to my kid who wants it, but I'm really giving a gift to me. And when, when I'm doing that, I am like removing any chance that you will ever have any feeling of probation. Like, if you want yeah. like this, yeah. you will have it. It's not about going like, oh, do we really need more calico critters in the house? <sighs> or beds for calico critters. We have so many beds for calico critters. And, uh, I have a calico critter at Ikea. You have no idea what the calico critter is. Yeah, but no, it's, yeah, you're right. I mean, with a son and a daughter, like, I feel like my wife, my wife, I'm going to blame her for this, but this is, is, is more prone to buy stuff for the kids. And so, it's a, that, that's me. That's me. And so she's buying, like, things that either she had as a child or would have loved to have had as a child. Sometimes she's kind of buying them for herself. I believe she actually has some American Girl dolls that are actually hers. Not that I'm saying, not that there's anything wrong with that, as they said. It's fine. But here's where it becomes a problem. And I do the same thing, you know, buying my kid a big Lego Star Destroyer, right? Because they're really cool, right? Here's where it becomes a problem. It's fine. I don't think you're, like, ruining your children by spoiling. But at a certain point, volume becomes an issue in terms of actual volume length width and height oh yeah like square square or like cu cu cubic cubic inches of stuff right yeah but also cubic inches of expectation right and yeah, that's that adds up to kids who treat toys and belongings as disposable because there's a seemingly unlimited supply you remove scarcity and so they don't give a damn about anything the way i treasured like the one expensive you know interesting toy that i had the way i like obsessed over my particular like little robot or Star Wars toy or something, they don't have that because they're like, I got a million of these and if this uh, one, if yeah. I don't care about this one, another one will just arrive in the house. I can't even, I can't even keep track of where all these things I own are. I don't even know everything that I own. So how can I care about, you know, so then you get disappointed that your children aren't treasuring their belongings the way that you did. It's because they have a million of them. But they are not to blame. When we say we're spoiling our kids, what we should really say is like, we're spoiling ourselves. Or ourselves are responsible. Yeah, no, it's, to it's totally, it's totally on us. Yeah, no, I mean, there's this like call it the SFM uh, phenomenon. <laughs> you get screens, food, and merchandise. And we're like, whatever we do, there will be like a uh, inexplicable gravity. I don't know what you call it, an attraction toward a screen or a food or some merchandise. And like, there's the whole experience idea. Like, I don't know whose kid like really loves just the experience. Maybe if you're like a sweet French boy with a funny hat, like you really like the idea of, oh, mama, it was so sweet of you to drop me by the graveyard. It is beautiful. But if you take a kid somewhere, they're gonna want a hat or a shirt or a doll or a keychain. I, th I think the, I think the experience thing is not that the kid's gonna like it, is that that's the thing that's actually gonna stay. And I I, I buy into that. Oh, but it's experience, true. Experiences are harder to pull off, especially since during if you have kids like mine. During most of the quote-unquote experiences, they will be complaining like it is the worst thing you've ever done to them. Oh no, it's, it's it's absolutely true. And of those, I mean, like I don't know if you take that, you know, screens, foods, and unfortunately, like, insert your own, whatever it is your kid, you, you've led your kid to be into. But like you, you will never be able to put the idea of an, ex rarely be able to put the idea of an experience on a book and like, you know, let some line out and have your kid run after that. With the exception of John Roderick arriving with the uh, with the James CRV, my daughter is extremely excited about that. But that is very, very unusual, and I have no one to blame but myself. You can see the link I just added to the notes. Two words: Dudley Dursley. I don't follow enough Harry Potter to know what you're referring to. Uh, well, especially you know Dudley is the son of the Dursleys. It's Harry's you know Harry's Harry's adoptive brother, and uh, the the show the movie, the first movie starts, and the book kind of starts with, you know, before he get, even gets invited to the Hogwarts, it's Dudley's birthday, and <laughs> uh, Dudley has gotten, what was it, he got you know, 36 presents, and he's mad because he got 37 last year, yep. and then Vernon swears he's, he's got two more coming, like it's going to be okay, and like there's something about that scene where I don't want that to make my heart clench up the way it does, but it does, where I go like, ah... That's not, that's not who my kid is, but that's, I don't want to be that. 
And I, I think most of us are, are going to be able to head that off before it gets to that stage. But like the first manifestation is what I just described before, of where you, you see that they're valuing this stuff less. Like that, it, it, you build up a tolerance. And here, but here, here's the pattern. And this is like, like don't. It's, it's not gonna hurt. It's gonna be. I've made this this way. But uh, if the acquisition rather than the having, rather than the collecting. Oh rather, yeah, no. Once you join it, it's it's boring. Yeah, like it's just another fuzzy thing in a pile. But uh, anyway, so that's yeah, that's all in us. So it's another thing we're doing poorly. I used to be. I was talking to my daughter about this today. We uh, we are in the middle right now of what we call Jubilee Week. Uh, we uh, sometimes I introduce the uh, I have introduced to my daughter the idea of the Jubilee, which is like basically the same thing as vacation. I was like, Jubilee Week is starting. Like we get all these days off and we got stuff and like, yeah, let's have some levity. Like we're gonna go and we're gonna you know go stay in a hotel and have turkey and stuff. Feats of strength. There, <laughs> bearing of grievances. What is it? it has a high. Uh, the, the steel has a high, a high to weight ratio or something. High tensile strength. Jubilee week. Staying in a hotel, eating turkey. It's exciting. But I was telling her today that, uh, and I've, I've joked about this. I think here and definitely on back to work. I used to be the worst at getting into vacations. But I think I told the story about you know being in Massachusetts and like trying to get a Wi-Fi signal. You, you know the story. I actually went into, I went into a vacation house that someone was not currently in and restarted their Linksys router. Yeah. I, yeah. So that's all true. I think we all have stories about uh, vacation wi Yeah, but like it used to be, I went through this period and I was trying to explain to her because, you know, she doesn't care. But I was trying to say, like, you know, I used to write uh, and I used to post to the internet. <laughs> and she says, put this on Tumblr. That's her word for put it on, put it on Wi Fi. That's her word, put this on Wi Fi. I, you know, I used to write things and put it on Wi-Fi uh, every day, so it was a couple times a day. So I was like, you know, my old job I used to have, I, it was kind of stressful because I was always working on something. And uh, I was trying to explain to her, in my mind, like why it was really hard for me to get into vacations to where by 2006, it felt like it would take me the number of days we were on vacation minus one and a half to get me into the vacation. Do you know what I mean? I have found it in the past very hard to unhook and to get to where I can just go, hey, this is the thing we're doing now. Like, So you'd be like in work mode until one and a half days? But, you know, that's the funny part. It was kind of work mode. But like in the early days of Wi-Fi, in the, well, you know, at least in the early days of Wi-Fi or, uh, you know, mobile phones and wireless connectivity, that was in some ways the worst of worlds. Like having a trio and a sprint connection was kind of the worst because it was just enough to let you know there was probably something out there to worry about that you couldn't do much about. And so I'd bring all this equipment along and I'd do all this. But like, you know, the funny thing is I've actually gotten better at it. And I think doing podcasts has been really helpful for that. Now to have more stuff that I can only do in one place has helped a lot. I guess what I'm saying is like, I, I, part of the stress of the holidays for me used to be how hard it was to completely separate from what I'm doing at a given time. Why do I say that? Because I think that's really important. Like, you'll never completely separate from that, but, like, you have to, like, pass through some area, some decontamination zone, to get to where you're now officially in Jubilee mode. Like, now it is, it is time for our holiday season, whatever that is, even if that's for Labor Day. But, like, getting a clutch for getting into that gear faster, I think is a very healthy habit. And so yeah. part of my question was, are you in there? Uh, I think I, well, this is... I have two minds about that. On the one hand, I'm really good at it. I forget my I can forget my job exists within like moments of like leaving the office. Like and you can know like my, my old measure was like the judge of a good vacation is if I come back and can't remember any of my passwords, don't know what the hell I was working on. Like again, like you barely remember, do I have a job? Where do I work? I can disassociate pretty darn well. Cause it's like it's almost as if work and obligation is like a dream and vacation is like when you wake up and you forget the dream you know like the dream is so fresh in your mind but then like by the time you've actually got both your feet on the ground off of the bed the dream is fading you're like what was that i was feeling something in that dream it was really important what the hell happened oh whatever never mind and it just disappears and like my real life is when i don't have to work right and to some degree that illusion is afforded by the fact that somewhere I know that I do have a job and so I'm not spending the entire vacation worrying about how to buy food for the next week. So I'm like, I'm like, I'm essentially getting paid to do my job as a vacation, right? right? I'm still getting paid, but I'm not. And so it's the magic of vacation. On the other hand, because I'm a programmer and because I'm sometimes actually interested in what I'm doing, my brain is kind of working on programming problems. 
problems, large and small, in the background, whether I... Would you call it a background process, John? It's, it's a bad model, but like the, the subconscious, you know that? You ever hear that? You're like, you're running screen. Not really. I don't like screen or team ups, but, uh, but like, I remember the first time I heard that was when I was like 12 or 13, it was some kind of like subconscious mind BS thing. And then again, I Yeah, like if you, if you want to remember something, like... You know, think about it before you go to sleep. If you want to dream about this, like do this before you go right. to bed. And like your 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 quote unquote subconscious mind will come up with the answer, which I think has been kind of this Right, but but here's the thing about all that crap. If you stop thinking about it as an explanation of the real world and start thinking about it as sort of like a self hack or like a you know a suggestion or a model or any of those things combined. I remember doing. Do you I don't know what these puzzles are called? We'll look it up on the shelves, maybe. But the ones where it's like, um, it's got the word, the letters A-L-L, kind of big, and then to the right of it, it's got the word uh, world with a smaller text size, and you're supposed to figure out what common, uh, you know, word or phrase is this picture describing. Hmm. You're picturing that, and that one, that one, yeah. it, it, it's a small world after all. Because uh, oh, I see, but it's like right. almost like a rebus, so like it's visual. Yeah, whatever. I don't know yeah. what the name of it is, but anyway, there's a million of those things, and they're fun. And we used to have like you know little ditto sheets and printouts of them from school or whatever. Um, and the best thing about those is, like, we would have you would just do these sheets. I remember doing it on vacation. We'd have these sheets, and we'd all gather around the family, and everyone would feel clever when they figured one out, and you know. Uh, sometimes it was hard to tell because the printouts were bad or whatever. Like someone was trying to chip off the old block and it had a block and like you know calligraphy letters, but the chip is like, is that an error in printing? Oh, it's supposed <laughs> to be a chip. Chip off the old block. Anyway, sometimes you get stuck on one, uh, and there's two ways you can go when you get stuck on one of those. One is you can try to convince yourself that it is a phrase you've never heard of, which every once in a while is true, and that pisses you off. It's like, I know way I would have gotten that because I have no idea. What, I've never heard the phrase in his cups before. I never would have gotten it, right? So it's like, you felt like you wasted your time trying to figure something out. But sometimes there'll be someone there who knows the answer who will assure you this is a phrase that you know. Like, it's a small world after all. You've been on the ride. You've heard the song. I know yeah, but, you know but, but this. But fixating on it is not making it better. Right. And so you think about it, and it's a fun, kind of relaxing thing. But the subconscious BS thing was, just go to sleep. And when you wake up in the morning, the answer will be in your head. Which is mostly total BS. But the power of that suggestion, combined with the fact that your brain does crap when you're asleep. I'm totally convinced that your brain does stuff when you're asleep. Yeah. Very, very frequently. I have had that exact experience with these particular puzzles. I would, you know, again, I was 12 or 13, I would try to work it out all day, I couldn't figure it out, I would try to convince myself that it's afraid that I don't know, I would be told otherwise, and I would, I would believe to myself that I'm going to do the thing that they said and whatever that, you know, focus life springs program. <laughs> but uh, it uh, was on television, I had to go to sleep, and uh, oh, right, 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 and I would wake up in the morning, and the Your vocabulary is increasing. And the answer would be in my head. And yes. then, like after a second, I would wake up, and I would come open, and it would like, boom, no. And that's like the magic of like BSing your own mind about that. Somehow we got on this topic. I, I think no, no, I think that's real. And like, and the things I don't need a scientific explanation for that. I mean, I heard something similar a long time ago, and I wouldn't accept, uh, I wouldn't like suggest this to you, except it works. Which is this, like when you're trying to remember something. Uh, First of all, I don't know, I can't explain the physiological process. You stress out a little bit, you tighten up, and you hunker down. You try to really, really, really remember. You go, oh, come on, it's that, oh, with the thing and the... And what I learned a long time ago is if you really want to remember something, you say the following thing to myself. I'm going to stop thinking about this, and not long after I stop thinking about it, I'll remember what it is. I don't know why, but I will. And you know what? It almost worked. It worked literally last night. My wife and I were watching TV, and she's like, oh, you know Rick from Walk the Dead? You know, he's married to the daughter of the singer from Jeff Rattel. And I was like, really? Oh, that's interesting. And she goes, yeah, what's his name? Is it Ian Hunter? And I was like, oh, Jeff Rattel, it's Ian. And then I said, it'll come to me. And I stopped. And two minutes later, I turned to her and I said, Ian Anderson. And here's my explanation for that, which is non-scientific, which is that it's not so much there's magic happening in your mind, it's that you've agreed to stop slathering stress onto yourself, <laughs> and it allows your mind to work as it wants to work, 
without you adding all these layers of self-talk about what you should be thinking. Yeah, and I think what it comes down to is you can come up with many reasons why people come up with things like, I'll remember this after I sacrifice a goat. Like, at a certain point, that starts working. Like, anything, anything you it's make a, up. It's a, it's a mnemonic, it could work. Yeah. Right, anything you make up will work. That's the beauty of it. And you don't have to, like, believe in it and kind yeah, of... Yeah, but, but you're hanging you're hanging a lantern right. on it, right? Right, you just, all you're trying to do is come up with a model or a pattern or a set of steps that leads you to success in this way. And it really almost doesn't matter what you do. Now, you can, and, and what does matter is that, like, is that what if what I do is I get really tense, right? And I, and I just, like, think really hard about, like, because you don't believe that that would be useful, because you have the idea that, like, if I just relax and chill, whether that's true or not, because you, because that story makes sense to you, that's why it works for you. If you believe the opposite, if you believe relaxing will make right. you forget things and you have to concentrate, then that will work for you. So it doesn't even matter what you think about. Like, for example, one of my memory things that I went through, and again, probably heard somewhere or whatever, because it made sense to me mentally, that's why it works. And it's, uh, if you can't remember something, just go through the alphabet. Just go through, does it begin with A? And try, just try to like sound out words that begin with A in your head, and then go, no, go to B, try to right. sound out words. And you don't know what word you're thinking of. How am I, I supposed I, to know? I don't know why those things work, but I know they work. Right, and so and, and the only reason that works for me is because that system, when I heard it from wherever I heard it, it made sense to me. Like, oh, that kind of makes sense. Let me try it. If it didn't make sense to me, it wouldn't work. You know what I mean? Someday, someday let's talk about my incredibly Byzantine method methodology for remembering dreams. Because I, I don't talk about it a lot. I don't talk about it a lot because it's boring, but I'm very interested in dreams. No one wants to hear them, but I have a, a very interesting, complex methodology for doing this that involves a lot of this weird rigmarole and ritual, and it actually seems to work. Why do you, aside from that, why do you want to remember dreams? Forget about the methodology. Why is this even a goal? Um, I mean, just on the face of it, because I like stories, and I especially like stories that I've heard. stories? You know, oh, Jesus Christ, you would not believe what I went through last night. You have dreams. Well, you cannot, oh, you're kidding. You can not believe what I went through last night. It was, it was unbelievable. Oh, I wonder if you're synthesizing these, these stories after the fact. Is that like retconning the, the garbage in your dreams into a coherent story? Well, that's part of the system. That's that's part of the system. I don't want to get into it. We don't have time. We need to wrap this up soon. But, like, I, I, I can tell you that part of it is trying. You can't try too hard. You have to loosen your grip. And... But, like, it does involve, like, a lot of letting go. And, like, I don't know what, there's, there's probably somebody, like, like there are probably neurologists that could give us a very plausible explanation for why this is. I mean, in, in layperson's terms, it's like when you stop stressing about something and let your brain just do what it's good at, it will occur to you. And whatever MacGuffin it takes to do that, like, do it. I think the belief that if you just stop stressing and let your brain do what you do, that is the MacGuffin. Because you believe that, that's why it works for you. You're giving me a meta model. It's just like because that theory makes sense to me. Because the idea that stressing about it is stopping when you do just somehow that you're Oh, you took it and you turned it. This is your week to be. It's your week to be mean to me. I get no, it. No, 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 no. I do exactly the same thing. Because the alphabet thing makes sense to me, right? According to my. That's why it works for me. So, like, it's not, you know what I mean? It's not as if what you said is, I really believe that if you just let your brain do it, yeah, it will do get the answer. Therefore, I use this technique to let my brain. It's the opposite. It's like, it's because that theory makes sense to you. Which is fine, like, it doesn't really matter. All you care about is the results, uh, right? You're right, it's more like faith revolution. Oh. Uh, I see your point. <laughs> anyway, I, I love those uh, games like that. Especially especially as they, as they relate to game, actual games like this. Is that what they're called, the grievous things? Um, I like it in the context of the game, because there are no stakes in that situation. Any... Well, but there's also, there's also modality. There's also, I, I don't know if that's exactly the right word, but there's, like, I do believe that there are different modes of thinking. Again, another model, thank you. Uh, but I think there are ways of, of, like, I don't know if it's left or right brain, or however you want to think about it, whatever your model is. But, like, it's funny how once you get into a certain, uh, I guess what John Cleese would call an open way of thinking, um, when you're in a more open, open and generative mode of thinking, if you can stick with it and like work that muscle, like nothing seems impossible. It's just difficult to get into and it's difficult to stay there. But like, you know, you go like, hey, you know what? I don't care how it works. I'll put this on a spark plug. Like, I can make this work. So, um, yeah, this is, this is interesting um, in a meta meta model model way. Like, this is another one of those things where it's, this is not how I expected you to be. 